Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the ResGen Giving Life Podcast, where we hear stories and have conversations about life in Christ, integrating our faith into every area of our life, and talk about ways that we as men can give life to others at home, at work, and in the community. My name is Tom Henderson, the founder of ResGen, and I'm excited to have you joining me wherever you happen to be right now. My guest today is Chris Lawrence. Chris is a follower of Jesus, husband, and father of two children, ages eight and four. He's also a cancer survivor and the founder of Hope Has Arrived, a nonprofit organization with the mission of helping people find hope, strength, and peace in their battle against cancer. On today's show, Chris and I visit about his journey with cancer, how his ministry helps people find hope in their battle against the disease, and why our culture is so afraid of cancer and really suffering as a whole. We also talk about how we can encourage and minister to others who are struggling and some of the things that we should and should not say to people in our relational world who currently have cancer or who are just going through challenging times. I have a feeling this is going to be a very helpful episode of the Giving Life podcast. So let's get into it. Here's my conversation with Chris Lawrence. Chris Lawrence, welcome to the Giving Life Podcast, brother. Hey, thank you. It's great to be with you. Yeah, it's it's good to have you here. And we were just talking a little bit before we hit record on this thing that uh, you actually are a Sioux Falls native, although, I mean, you're currently living in Colorado Springs, um, but uh, but you were raised right here in the in the great city of, of Sioux Falls. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm born and raised Sioux Falls, so. Okay. Well, well, very good. Well, I think it's going to be a lot of, um, I think uh, what the way that I said in the intro, uh, Chris was that I, I just feel like this is going to be a helpful episode for people. I think it's going to be really, really helpful and, and, uh, hope giving life giving. I mean, this is the, the giving life podcast, which I think is so fitting with your story because, um, your story, the work that you're doing through hope has arrived and through, I know that you work for crew, um, as well. And, and it's all about giving people life and giving people hope. So I just feel like this is just going to be some great synergy in our conversation, but I'd, I'd first just like for you to introduce yourself, uh, because this is going to be an introduction to you, uh, for, for many of our listeners and viewers. So I'd love for you just to give a quick little intro and then we're going to, we're going to dive into our content today. Sure. Yeah, no, I'd be happy, uh, to share more about myself. So I'm Chris Lawrence, uh, grew up in Sioux Falls. I've, kind of lived off and on there since at different points, but I, I currently work for Crew, and I am the founder and executive director of a ministry called Hope Has Arrived, which is a ministry that helps people find hope, strength, and peace against cancer. Mm -hmm. And then um, you know, I've worked for Crew for 20 years. I did outdoor ministry a lot of years, so taking people on different adventures. It was mostly college students that I was taking on you know rock climbing adventures and rafting and you know it's it's fun stuff right yeah. with the college students they love it and then you know cancer ministry is also great but it's uh it's very different in a lot of ways too so <laughs> right right well and it's easier to take people on whitewater rafting trips in colorado than it is in sioux falls so um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so I can understand why you're living in the beauty of Colorado and <laughs> and the mountainous areas of of uh, that you, that you're in. So, um, well, so let, let's kind of dive in here a little bit because, um, you know, one of the main conversations that we're going to have is regarding just cancer and the ministry that that you know birthed out of your journey and your battle with uh, with cancer. Um, you know, at age age thirty seven. Um, that's when you were diagnosed, correct? With, uh, with yes. cancer yourself and, and you were diagnosed with stage four, um, yes. uh, right away. I mean, you just did, you didn't even go through the stages. You didn't go stage one and the stage, you just went right into stage four. Such an overachiever. That's right. Yeah. I just, I just, you know, went right for it. So. Yeah. I probably shouldn't joke <laughs> yeah. about that, but, 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 but there's proof right there that, that talks about how quickly life can change. Um, and how, how one diagnosis, one situation, one experience in our life really can change the trajectory of your life. And, and, um, you know, we hear about people that are diagnosed with cancer and all the emotions that go along with that, the fear, pain, um, loneliness questions. Um, so let me ask you this, Chris, when, when you heard those words for the first time, um, and that you were. Uh, now, um, 
now carrying that. And what, what were the what was the thoughts that you and your wife had? Uh, what were those first months like for you? Oh yeah, I mean it was it was a really difficult time. I mean to say the least. I mean you nailed it. It's fear, pain, loneliness. Um, but when I first heard the words from a doctor that and and he couldn't. It was a sports medicine doctor. You know, I, I got this phone call. We're, we're driving in Longmont, Colorado. That's where we were living at the time. And got this call. It was supposed to be like a routine thing. I had this sports injury. My back was hurting. I was doing a lot of triathlons and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I thought he was going to tell me I messed up a, a disc in my back. Hmm. And it kind of been this ongoing thing. And instead, he's like, oh, uh, we got the results here, MRI. And he, he was he was emotionally breaking up on the phone, which is never what you want your doctor to do. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, it looks like that, that spot in your back, it looks like there's, there's cancer and it's spreading from someone else. And so, you know, I heard that I had to pull the car over lest I drive in the ditch or what, I mean, it was, you know, it just takes your breath away to mm -hmm. get that kind of news. And then the fear was overwhelming and we had a lot of time to sit on that, which was, hard. Uh, it's not like you get this kind of bomb dropped on you, you know, like in, it's like someone puts a bomb down your chimney. That's one of my friends talked about when he mm. had a cancer diagnosis, something like that. It's probably pretty accurate. You know, mm. it just blows up everything. Mm. And I remember my wife and I were processing it and just immediately like the focus in my life, it just got really clear what, when we stripped down like my priorities, I'm like, mm. wow. Um, Am I going to get to be here for my wife and my daughter? Am I going to be, what's going to happen? You know, so it was just a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, and it, it was the roughest time. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. And, and, and how old are you now, Chris? Just so. Uh, I'm 45. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So, I mean, this is, so this was eight years ago that this all, all took place and, and, you know, when you when you talk about having going through difficult challenges and difficult things, um, we talk about you know how important faith is. Um, but yet, even but just because we are faith filled, and you've been a believer for, for so long, you've been in the ministry for so long, that doesn't necessarily mean that okay, um, there's no fear there, that there's not this yeah. like. Um, did you go through a a, um, a season of or conversations of, of disbelief, like, no, this, this can't be happening to me. Um, the, the, why me, the, um, why would God allow this to happen kind of thing? I'm doing his work even like, God, I'm doing your work. You yeah. know, like, did, did you have some of those kinds of feelings? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, I, yeah, I've been, I was in full-time ministry. So it wasn't like, you know, like faith was important. Like I, but uh, I guess it was kind of this whole experience of, learning about hope and what Christ actually provides. I thought I understood it before going through cancer, but it was kind of like this whole experience to learn more about it. But yeah, in the beginning, I was asking some questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, God, you it just seems like you're asking a lot of me right now. Like what, mm. what is this? And I'm going to tell you something, Tom, this is kind of a darker part of it, but it's true. It's what happened three months before I got this diagnosis, we went to a funeral of a family friend with the same type of cancer, although she was a little older than me, and she was diagnosed uh, with a lot earlier stage, and we were at her funeral. So then three months later, mm. I get this diagnosis, and it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, like what? I didn't know what God was doing. I didn't know what he had, you know? And it was like, yeah, it was a total loss of hope I still had spiritual hope, but it was, it was hard. Yeah. And it, you know, the only place, you know, it's like, I couldn't read any of the Bible except the Psalms. Mm. And there's so many great Psalms about, you know, people like David's asking questions, you know, where are you, God? Have you forgotten me? Um, and there's just a lot of Psalms like that. And I found my home there. It was all I could read because it was exactly what I was living and where I was at. Mm -hmm. It was in good company. 
Well, man, and I, I'm so glad that you brought that up with with the Psalms because I, I love steering people there because you know over two thirds of them are laments. I mean, they're just more of the like, oh my gosh, what is going on? You know, oftentimes we go to the you know the the praise uh, Psalms, and I mean, which which is perfect for when we need those, but there's so many of them that are just like this bleeding heart of just, God, I need you right now. I mean, I'm going through this difficult time and I, and I need you right now. So, so let me ask you this then, Chris. So let's, so, so then you go start going through treatment and all this kind of thing. And I know that we're going to not go through all the intricacies of, of the journey because you're actually going to be in Sioux Falls in about a week and you're going to be doing this uh, at, at a lunch that we're going to talk about later on in the, uh, in the podcast. But, but um, as you're going through that treatment, what are the things that gave you really hope? Because um, we're going to get into this whole uh, just ministry that you started and how you actually help others find hope uh, in their journey. So as you were going through your journey, what are the things that really gave you hope? You talked about the, the hope in just the faith that you had, for sure. But at the same time, just wondering, what, were there other things? I'm sure there were yeah yeah for sure there you know what was tough about my journey and you know everyone's journey is unique and i know we like people that go through cancer there's a whole myriad of different challenges and whatnot but for me it, it was it was hard because um it, there was just like uh i was not getting hope in the traditional places you know like mm -hmm. medicine not getting anything they pretty much you have a year to live you know um, and if you do chemo, it might prolong that, but it's going to be miserable. It's going to be kind of futile. Hmm. So that wasn't there. You know, there's a whole aspect in the cancer world of, you know, you just got to fight it. You just got to fight it. And, and, and I, I, I understand there is some value there. But for me, when they give you this diagnosis that's kind of like incurable and hopeless, fighting, I was going to lose, hmm. you know. And so it's like uh, what, then I fight and then I lose and then I die a loser, you know? Mm. Um, and then, you know, you, I couldn't buy my way out of the diagnosis. Not that I had much money anyway, I'm in ministry, <laughs> but, uh, um, and so there was just a lot of things that, I mean, really the hope, especially for a long time was just, just in the Psalms, you know, just asking God for help, mm -hmm. asking God for a chance to fight this cancer a chance to be able to, survive but uh i just i didn't know what was going to happen and i was reflecting over my life and really thankful for everything that god had done but it felt incomplete too mm -hmm. you know i just my wife and i had been married for maybe three or four years at that point and we we didn't meet until our early 30s and elizabeth is amazing you know i love my wife so much and i i wish we had met in college but it just <laughs> that, that wasn't our story but I meet her and, you know, like when I was getting this diagnosis, I had some grandparents that celebrated a 70th wedding anniversary. And I'm like, I want 70 years with this woman. And, you know, I get this and it's like, I don't know. Everything that I'm hearing is that's not even remotely going to happen. And I don't think the math adds up anyway when you get married in your <laughs> like 30s. So like, yeah. <laughs> you're going to be, you're gonna be over like 100, like, yeah. you know. <laughs> right. So, but at that point, you're thinking, I'd be happy with seven. I mean, that's, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just like, I, I, and, and, you know, and even that just, like, man, I feel like I'm being robbed. I'm feeling, feel like I'm being robbed of, of, of time with that. So, so then fast forward, I mean, and, and so you are, how, how, how long were you in treatment? How long did, was that, was that process for you? Yeah, it was a long process. Um, I mean, I, I can share part of the journey. I'm, I'll, I'll share it in detail. And, you know, there'll, there'll be things I'd share, like, you know, when I do the event in Sioux Falls. Yeah. That, you know, but I, I got to give you some, man, because, yeah. like, it, it, won't, it won't make sense otherwise. Uh, so what happened was, and so I didn't know it was going to happen. I had all this kind of hanging over me. And kind of what happened next was unexpected. Like, we, you know, we had, I was getting treated at Avera. And I, I just got to say this. I, I love both of our medical systems in Sioux Falls. They, they're amazing. Their commitment to cancer research and just like the quality of healthcare. I don't think people can, I think a lot of people get it, but maybe they don't fully get it. Like, like Sioux Falls is crushing it. Yeah. Um, 
but I ended up landing at Avera, but uh, there was this doctor they were going to have me meet with, and I didn't know anything about this. I'd already met with, like, I don't know, three or four doctors and, you know, all this, and I was honestly getting so weary of these meetings because it was always, you know, like, they were professional, they were great, but, you know, traditional medicine, there just wasn't hope to be found in this case. Hmm. And they were going to try to help me the best they could. But uh, but then they're like, hey, there's one other doctor we want you to meet with. And I'm like, okay. And so my dad and my wife and I, we went and met with this doctor. And he, he was a cancer researcher. I didn't know much about him or anything. But he walks in the room and he, he's got this thick British accent. And he has his team of medical professionals with him, kind of like his entourage. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> he's like, well... I know how to treat this. And we're just like, what? <laughs> who, who is this guy? Yeah. And, then what, and like, I, I didn't see this meeting coming at all. And it, he was also, you know, it was, he was saying, he was kind of giving like this hope. And he, he went on to explain that, uh, you know, he had done some, this blood test that can look at the drivers of your cancer. It's kind of, it's something they're practicing in cancer care a lot now, mm -hmm. you know, targeted treatment. But he was like, this is what's causing your cancer. And if we do this treatment plan, I believe that we can, we can treat it. Hmm. And, um, and they gave no guarantees. He's not saying, right. you know, you do this and this, you know, there's, there's types of cancer. I'm so thankful that they got it down. You know, it's like, we got so much body of evidence and the textbook says you do this, you do this. And most likely you'll be cured. But uh, that's not what they were saying. But he gave this hope. And when he left the room and, you know, I was talking to my wife and my dad, we we're just like, what just happened? Hmm. And, you know, it was kind of what I prayed for. Just, just God, just give me a chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then, um, so we, we were like, okay, it's a chance. Let's do this. And that was kind of the start of, I, well, I got to say this too. That day, my dad wrote hope on the board in the room and uh he also reserved the url hope has arrived because oh. <laughs> it was kind of this this moment you know yeah yeah <laughs> um he didn't tell me about that till later which i'm thankful because i would have been like what yeah <laughs> you know, i don't really want to hear about that <laughs> yeah exactly but, uh, <laughs> you know yeah so that was kind of the start and then i you know kind of had to sign some stuff about like hey i'm going to do this experimental treatment and so I did, mm -hmm. but it turned out this doctor was not blowing smoke. He knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And it, it quickly, uh, you know, my, my scan started showing clear, but, you know, I love to say, oh, that was it. And yeah. then I was, you know, that was the end of the story. It's like, no, that's you know, stage four cancer is a journey. Yeah. It's long. I had a lot ahead of me. Mm -hmm. There was uncertainty. We were kind of off the map. So it's not, they were like, well, once we do this and then everything's good, mm -hmm. uh, it was still a process, but I think God really used that doctor to give me and my family hope that day. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, fast forward then to the end of the treatment, which you said was, was a long journey and all of that. And, uh, and so then you, you were told that you were cancer free, mm -hmm. um, after how many years did they feel like, okay, now we can say this. <laughs> you know what? Um, it's a matter of debate, but uh, <clears throat> within time, it was kind of irrefutable. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it, it could be anywhere from a year to uh, you know, maybe four years. I don't know, depending. Because mm -hmm. then you get into this weird thing. Because they even said, "I'm like, so I'm in remission," and they're like, "No." <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, my no evidence of disease," and they're like, "Well, yeah." <laughs> um, so my cured, it's like, well, no, we, we don't really know. We just, you might be cured. We just don't know yet. Mm. So it was kind of this, this journey and it was, uh, I needed hope at every turn. Honestly, it was not a quick, quick thing. And, and, but I, I mean, that's the, the thing as I've learned about hope, that's really all we have is kind of hope in today mm -hmm. and hope for what's coming and, and, just kind of walking day by day. Yeah. That's really what we have. So 
Were there things that uh, that you that you did purposefully, intentionally to uh, to take your mind off of the difficult journey that it was? Um, to number one, uh, in try to do the best you could to enjoy uh, the, the life that you still had. Um, and then also figuring out being someone that had been in ministry, um, or is in ministry, it's always about, you know, pouring ourselves out, which is an important part of anybody who, if you're really going to be in ministry, that's, that's the calls to serve others in the name of Jesus. Um, but of course there's also the part where we need to receive the ministry. So I'm sure there's people that receive ministries, but I'm also interested just like, so, um, what are some of the things that you did just to, to still say like, man, I still want to enjoy enjoy life yeah yeah i mean it was it was tough like the the first year was just kind of like in the bunker Mm. you know (laughs) the bunker like it was like you know in the foxhole really i mean it was pretty hunkered down but uh life did get a little bit more manageable i mean i was i took medical leave for leave for six months um that was that was that was challenging and then uh something i did actually was really hopeful was my my background's writing and uh i was writing a devotional and i was writing it was an outdoor devotional mm-hmm. i've always loved outdoor adventure and it's just something that god has used to kind of bless me connect me with other friends and things like that and i thought about that stuff a lot and even when i couldn't do it just to have some some kind of connection and it, it was uh it really ministered to me mm-hmm. which was really fun and uh Side note, I mean, it's cool. Actually, <laughs> a year ago, there was a publisher who picked it up, and it's it's out there now. It's uh, Call to the Wild is the name of the book, but um, it is it is about, I mean, gosh, going through cancer is kind of wild, you know, so is Outdoor Adventure, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, um, and I think as my health did improve, and they kind of got things under control, then I was able to start getting back into, you know, some activities and things like that. Um, and in Sioux Falls, when I was there, I had, this is fun. I, so I, they had a race league at the local ski hill that I would do on Wednesday nights. And, uh, that was, that was a blast, yeah. you know, nice, nice people. It's fun. It's just skiing is one of my favorite sports. And I know people are like, Hey, our hill's not very big, but I'm like, Hey, it's a hill. We got snow. <laughs> it's a hill. We got snow here, man. This is fun. Yeah. Well, and, and, and doing some of the things that you enjoy doing. I mean, that's the key yes. because I mean, it's, it's when, when we're going through those difficult and, and ch- journeys that we don't choose those difficult times that, you know, you would have never chosen that, but you still got to find things. Okay. How, do, how do I still find ways to minister, allow God to minister to me in the season that I'm in. And that was one of the ways that, that, was that was part of who who you are and who you and and that allowed you to be who you were which is Mm -hmm. and so that was a a gift yes it was a it wasn't like skiing at breckenridge no one would say great bear (laughs) in sioux falls it's like breckenridge in colorado (laughs) but yet nonetheless you're on a hill and you're and you're you're skiing down it and and you know feeling the smile from doing that which um is not to be minimized absolutely yeah and uh I was involved with some men's ministry stuff in Sioux Falls too, which is really cool. Bible study fellowship. That was, that was huge. That was a, you know, big blessing in my life too. Just things like that. Uh, you, you're so right, Tom, like just I think when you go through difficult things and even something like cancer or other hard medical diagnosis or life changing things, it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. stay hold to your identity. I mean, of course your identity, my identity is in Christ, but God has made us each certain ways of things that we gravitate towards. And they're not bad things mm-hmm. as long as he's like kind of first and he's the love of our life. It's then I think he gives us these gifts. And so finding ways to engage with some of these things that, you know, so who he made me to be was really healthy and helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that, uh, that, you know, we, we traded some emails back and forth was, was this question of, you know, we, we live in a culture and a society that like we, we will do anything we can to avoid suffering. Right. I mean, we'll just, yeah. we will just, um, like if we see any possibility of suffering or having to do something that's hard, 
a lot of times it's like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sign up for that. So uh, let me ask you as, as we, as you know, obviously no one chooses cancer, but that is a word that does strike fear. Um, and a lot yeah. of times it is because it is so random. I mean, you, you hear about how random it is. Um, I mean, you, you are a very healthy individual, right? I mean, you're, you're doing everything. That was the last word that you ever thought would come into your world. You hear about, um, we've had some friends that their, their child would very, very small childhood cancer, right? I mean, just, so what, what is it about just suffering, but cancer specifically that just causes us to to fear that so much. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Um, it is. I've been reading about it. It's kind of nerding out on it a little bit. I mean, just there's a whole philosophical structure behind why our current modern society suffers so badly. Hmm. Like, in other words, we the 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 i mean I, hey I'm, I'm not trying to complain like i like i like our culture i'm home at, i'm feel at home in it but like one of the things we don't do well is that because we're so individualistic and we we prize like pursuing things that you know give us you know happiness and joy like part of that is that uh when you suffer or you get something like cancer it's a massive interruption to that freedom hmm. and there's past societies. It's not like that they like to suffer, but I think they were more about kind of uh, um, like the community, maybe their family was. Kind of, and so when they suffered, they almost saw it as part of. It, it was a necessary thing that would help make them stronger, help their community. And so I think for me and other people, when you get this diagnosis, there's some cultural things going on there that are hard to peel back. Like we, I think we're myself included. I'm like, I hate this. <laughs> sure. And I think cancer in particular, it's just, it has the potential to be so life changing. And, you know, there's the people, people's physical parents changes and mm -hmm. can change lifestyle. I mean, it is scary. Mm -hmm. it, there's, there's good reason for it. And you mentioned childhood cancer, you know, with hope has arrived. We definitely, you know, I interview, I've interviewed lots of uh, families and even some childhood cancer survivors. And it's hard. Like I, it was hard enough going through it in my 30s. I can't imagine being that young. And it's, so uh, there's good reason for fear. I mean, I think there's better reasons mm -hmm. for hope, but the fear is real. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, just hope has arrived. And uh, you mentioned your dad uh, got that URL and then you were able to establish the URL. So uh, right after you were in remission, cured, where well, there was some question as to the timing of that, like you mentioned. But so um, how how soon after that season did you say, hey, let's let's try to do something here that really can help others give life to others instill hope in others that are going through through uh, their cancer journey yeah well um we started it in 2018 we, we uh you know um registered a non-profit profit in the state of south dakota actually south dakota is still currently the only state we're registered in that we're okay mostly internet based so i mean it's borderless you know we reach over 151 countries right now but uh hmm. Um, at first, you know, it was 2018, so I was pretty fresh in the journey. Mm -hmm. I honestly did not want to do it. I, it was so painful, so difficult personally that like, when I saw this, you know, we kind of saw this opportunity, saw this void where, you know, you search around the, like the internet, um, there's a lot of great inf uh, medical information, but especially if you're like what I was going through, you start searching medically, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It's hopeless mm -hmm. and it's, it's really not, what's going to help you. Um, and so we saw this void of like, maybe there could be some, some hopeful stories some hopeful articles, just things that would kind of be in that space to help people see that there actually is hope too. But, um, initially, you know, when my dad brought that up, I'm like, I can't even talk about that right now. It's kind of got to get through this myself, mm -hmm. but eventually there was a couple things that, um, happened or just, got to kind of put on my heart in a few different ways uh some some psalms honestly psalm yep. 40 where it talks about 
you know, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. And I'm like, wow, what? There could not be a, a better description of what going through cancer is like the slimy pit. Right? Mm. And I was also reading this other, there's a devotional. It's about the names of God, but the, the author was talking about how, you know, so often we want to get, we want to be healed of things that we need healing from, but we don't want to be involved in other people's healing mm -hmm. and in their story with that. And it was like so convicting. Mm. I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to just get, get my healing and, you know, just leave this whole cancer thing behind. Yeah. But God just was really working on my heart and I just saw there was, uh, especially as I kind of firsthand got a deeper understanding of his hope, um, I just saw that I, I wanted to be a part of that to help others find hope. Mm. And, that, and, and as I did it, it was hard at first, but I began seeing there's a lot of joy there and just also this kind of surprise compassion, like pretty uh, core and overwhelming that I just really... I understand what people are going through. I mean, maybe I don't, you know, haven't walked their shoes. I don't know the exact journey, but I, there's so much crossover with the cancer experience that it was pretty easily, you know, pretty easy to like connect with other people on back to that cancer. And I remember even just interviewing some people for the first time. It was, uh, it was pretty powerful. Hmm. And, uh, so it was not what I wanted, but it became a ministry that is a joy, I would say. Well, and, and it was, and what you found in just your own searching and what you found through just doing is how needed it is. Because it doesn't just, it doesn't go into 151 countries in the course of less than six years if it's not needed. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, yeah. the the Lord is using it in, in powerful ways, and and the you know the the need for it is just so evident when you when you you know you read the 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 way 151 countries and you know, well over a million people is is uh, just I mean how. how Right, I mean that, that you've been able to impact and, and instill hope in. So, so let, let's just talk about just um, what what can be found at the website. What what are some of the things that you do to help people find hope? Because it's easy to say, "Hey, look, you know, let's just keep hope alive," you know. But how do you truly do that? And how has hope arrived for other people because of hope has arrived being present in their lives? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Yeah, because I think hope, hope can be a little abstract. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's one of the most powerful virtues ever, but it can be a little abstract. So, uh, and actually, we so we've been able to reach over three million people since we started, and that's amazing. I mean, that that is kind of blowing my mind. But you're right, people, and I'd like to say, oh, we're just you know we're so our content's so good. <laughs> I think our content is good, but there's just it's the need. Yeah. You know, cancer, it just, um, but uh, so the four ways that we found that we help people find hope, um, we, we found there's four, right? It's the first one is stories of hope, uh, just telling stories of other fighters, survivors, um, even some caregivers or family members. We've done over 54 so far. My background's journalism, so, you know, just interviewing people, telling their stories, and you, you would think, oh, that sounds nice, but I, I talk to people all the time and I say, okay, so tell me, how did you connect with this? How did we help you? And they said it was the stories. Hmm. It was the stories yeah. because I was facing a tough diagnosis. And even though the, 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 you know, their stories weren't exactly the same and your diagnosis wasn't the same, there was this sense that when I read that they were able to get through that, that I thought maybe I could too. Hmm. And you know, there, there was something about it. people feel connected, they feel inspired. So the stories thing is huge. That's, that's the first one. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there's a, there's a story on there called Back from the Edge. It's actually one of my friends in Sioux Falls. He's a videographer in town. Um, but he went through this fast growing cancer while he was like watching the Super Bowl. He thought he had the flu. This is like 15 years ago. It had this, you know, they, they saved his life. Sanford saved his life. It was pretty crazy, but uh, his story's been read by over it's been read over five hundred thousand times. Hmm. I mean, like people just eat it up. 
But so stories is one. The second thing is, you know, um, strength for the journey. It's just articles about the cancer experience and what it's like to go through it. It's also for people that aren't necessarily going through it themselves, but they want to be encouraging to those that are. So there's like, Ooh, that's good. we have a cancer, cancer chaplain on our board and he wrote, what to say to someone with cancer and what not to say. Yeah. And I want to, and I want to <laughs> dig into that um, after we, after we do this, I, I really want to get into that because I think that that's going to be super helpful. Um, so I, I love that that is a part of this. Um, so I, I want to circle back on that and, and really kind of dive yeah. into that at a deeper level if we can, um, as, as you continue to work through this list. But, but that I think is so good be- that you mentioned that because um so many times it's not just about the people that are going through like yourself, but it's about, well, how do we help your wife, your kids? Um, how do we help parents of kids that are suffering from cancer? How do we give them strength for the, for the journey that they're on as well? Um, when they have to be strong. I mean, I was just with a friend, just, I mean, I was on, uh, on good Friday, I went and visited him in the hospital. Um, he's got stage four cancer, same thing. Um, and Mm -hmm. sat with he and his wife for about 45 minutes or so in, in the hospital room, um, where, you know, there's a recognition of, okay, this is the day that Jesus went to drive, die. It's known as good Friday. We're not, we're thankful for the resurrection that's coming, but man, this is hard. This is really, really tough. Right. And one of the things that I, that I talked with his wife about is how, how are you taking care of yourself? And how are you being cared for and given strength during this? Because it's not just your husband going through it. It's, it's you. So I'm, I'm really anxious to hear a little bit more about that as we, as we come back to that. But I'm, I'm just so grateful that that's, that's a big focus that you're, that you're trying to make sure that you guys hit real strong. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing about your friend and you know, that's really cool. You got to be there for him and visit him. And that, that's awesome. Uh, I, 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 I forgot to mention this. So there's two other things in the floor, stories, helpful articles. The third thing is asking God for help. This surprised me, but hmm. people want, like they devour articles on prayer. And hmm. it's mostly, you know, a lot of times we'll get these people, they'll say, uh, I'm not religious, but I really need to know how to pray. Hmm. Well, how do I do this? Like I'm struggling with cancer and I want to know how to ask God for help. And so we have multiple articles about that. And originally, I, I would have thought, like, really? I mean, like, I know Christians might want that, but but generally, like, people want to know more about spiritual hope. Mm-hmm. And it's been really encouraging to be able to offer that. The fourth thing is we have a prayer and support group on Facebook, just, you know, community yeah, uh, for people to know that they're not alone. And then also the key word in that group is prayer and support group to so it it meets that felt need of having people pray for them. So. Mm, yeah, that's so good. I, and that's so interesting because I think that, that when you're faced with um, the unknown, when you're faced with those situations that uh, you realize how little control you have, uh, when you face with your mortality, um, no matter what, our heart is crying out for what's next. And, you know, what, you know, where is God? Um, how, how, if there is a God, how do I connect with that God? So I think that is such a real question that people ask. And so, um, so when you said asking God for help, it seems like such a simple thing, like, wait, that has to be a bullet point on what we do. But if we can meet people where they're at and realize that, man, we need to let people number one, let them know it's okay to ask God for help. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. It's warranted and you should, you know, and here's how you can do that. It's okay to go through the steps of grief and be upset with God. God's a big God. He can, he can handle it. He can handle our emotions regardless of what they are. We already talked about the Psalms and, and just the, the, the questions of why, like think about the book of Job, how many times the questions of why is asked in the book of Job, but God's desire is that these things drive us to him. They just drive us to him. And I love that that is what you're talking about here is asking God for help. And how do we help people do that? So, um, okay. So I want to go back to just this whole idea of, of what we should and shouldn't say, because I think that's, that's something that is just um, in general um, for people that are suffering, going through difficult times. I think there's a lot of times, especially in, in the Christian world that we can, we can, say certain things because it's 
just feels <laughs> good to say or like, oh, well, God is in control or, you know, whatever, which, yes, we we hear that, all of that. But but what are some of the things that that really is helpful and hope giving for us to know as if we're journeying with someone in our relational world that is going through cancer, um, maybe it's in, it's in our family. Um, and then I think that there's going to be some of this that is transferable to just journeying with people that are going through challenging times in life um, that, that will be able to be transferred to that. Maybe not in the same way, but some of the same principles. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I got to give credit. Um, we have a, a, a chaplain that's on the board of Hope Was Arrived, and he's just been a real gift. He's a pastor for a lot of years and chaplain, and gosh, he, he was working at the VA hospital, you know, so often with so many cancer patients. But, um, I mean, I, the hard thing is I think, and I think people, we meet, you know, people mean so well, they mm-hmm. want to be encouraging, mm-hmm. but sometimes they have a hard time of like dealing with their own fear of suffering and then trying to be there for them. There's kind of this, you know, it, it, it can be problematic a little bit, but I know here's one thing I think I start with, and it's in some of our articles I'll share, but uh, when you're talking to someone that's going through it, it's really good to keep the focus on them. In other words, like, if they want to talk about it, let's let's go there. If they don't, let's not. And I think, you know, if you search online, I'd love to pull up the top 10 things you can say to anybody with cancer and it's going to be encouraging. <laughs> the reality is a lot of those things do more harm than good. Because, hmm. um, I mean, I'll, give, I'll just give you a couple examples. And I'm not trying to make it overly complex because I really don't think it has to be. But I think we, we have to undig from some of the damage we do, because I think sometimes when someone's going through it, our reaction is maybe to, we, we got to say something that's going to be like just the right thing or to be the hero. But it's like, it's really about them. Hmm. How do we encourage them? Let's keep the focus on them. But like, for example, if you say, oh, you're so brave. And, huh, you know, that that might land on some people in an okay way. But others, I mean, for example, I have a, you know, a friend who's, wife has been going through cancer the last few years and you know she's like i don't want to be an inspiration i don't want to be brave like Mm. i just want to be me like i'm I'm tired of hearing that Mm -hmm. you know almost like puts pressure on them or or even if there's days when they don't feel brave and so it feels good to say that but it's maybe not that helpful Mm. i i think um another one that's and this is this is so like kind of split in hairs but like people are like I'm really sorry you're going through this. And when you say sorry, I know it. Like I know we, we mean well, but it often it almost implies a wrong was done. Hmm. It's, it, I think it's more appropriate to say like I'm really sad with what you're walking through, you know, and just want you to know I care about you. Like I think that's maybe a better way to say it. And again, I've I've learned from the the chaplain. He's like he's really been a, a blessing to uh, the whole hopeless arrive ministry, but. I think some other things that we say, oh, I know exactly how you feel. Hmm. You know, do we do we really? We don't. Hmm. Um, well, at least your cancer is treatable. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't say that one. Um, you know, let's see. I'm trying to. There's there's some other ones. Oh, I'm sure everything is going to be just fine. You know, it's like, well, where's your crystal ball mm. to know that that's true? What if it's not fine? Mm-hmm. Um, mm. You know, God is still there in that. But um, but yeah, I think it's keeping the focus on them. And I think it's just affirming that you care for them. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the, the question that can be very appropriate is, um, you know, how, how can I pray for you? Mm. Like at, at the appropriate point. And what I find it's really interesting that like sometimes people – will want to talk about their journey and other times they don't. They just want to talk. You know, maybe they just want to. Yeah. It's. They want to ski down the I'm, mountain of Great Bear. They just want Yeah, to, that's right. They just want to do something. <laughs> I remember, and again, it's significantly different, but there was a, there, you know, my wife had to have neck surgery um, several years ago. 
and 2019, and, and then prior to that, she had some some uh, stuff that where she was in the hospital for some GI stuff, and she was constantly getting asked, how are you? What can I do for you? How can I whatever? And I remember her, and to me, I was like, man, that's so nice. That's just, I mean, people, all these people care and all this, and, and she said, Tom, I'm more than just my health issues. Yeah. I'm more than just, you know, whatever I'm ailing from, and 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 it wasn't because, and it wasn't that she was not appreciative of the care that was being shown. She's just like, I just, I just want to have a normal conversation. I just want to be like, I just want to be normal, even though I don't necessarily always feel normal. And, and so I think that that, what you just said, that really resonated with me. And, um, when, you know, I've been in ministry now for almost 25 years and, and, uh, for many years, it was focused on teenagers, and, and now it's focused on men and marriages, um, more so. And and, but I I just remember being taught early in my youth pastoring years about the power of the ministry of presence and learning how to just be quiet. <laughs> and we don't sometimes we we run from uncomfortable silence because we feel like we got to say the right thing or we got to fill that time, but. Man, the ministry of presence um, is is just it's so powerful. Um, can can you just speak to that and in maybe in in your own journey of just what the presence of other people did for you? Oh yeah, it's huge. Yeah, I mean you nailed it. I I love that. And gosh, I'd love to give you some links for for some of these articles we have that kind of approach this topic too. But uh, yeah, the power of presence of just being there, and um, you know, and the thing is, I think people often they mean so well. Like you got to give them credit. Yeah. I think if they, if you're around them enough, you know, like they'll. I feel like if they're really trying to keep the focus on you, they're they're gonna get it right, and they're gonna know you that they care about you. But, um, but you said the ministry of presence. I would think you know, like for me. I just remember like my, my dad was really helpful to me. He was just, he was there a lot. He was checking up on me. He even came to appointments with my wife and I. And there was something, just some confidence in that, just like your your dad with you in it, you know, mm-hmm. kind of seeing what you're going through. And uh, he didn't, you know, it's not like he always had to come up with the right thing to say or, you know, same with my wife, you know, just was was there and, and uh, I think that's a that's a very powerful thing. Mm. Just it's almost like people they just feel loved and valued because you're you're you know you're with them. Mm. I think that's a that's a huge thing. But because the problem is a lot of times there's so many of these things, and even as a parent you learn this, it's like I can't fix everything my my kids are going through. Right. You know. <laughs> but I try to orchestrate a good life for them, but ultimately there's a lot that's out of my hands. <laughs> well, and the reality is, is that at the end of the day, um, the most important thing that we can do as parents, the most thing, the most important we can, thing we can do for other people is letting people know that, that we're in their corner, you know, that we're in their corner and that we're just, I mean, regardless of what they're facing, you know, I, and one of the, th- I just, whenever I think about in your corner, I know uh, you and I are about the same age. Um, I'm a couple years older than you, but you know, just the whole, like, who's your Burgess Meredith in the corner of Rocky. Right. And he's just like, you, <laughs> you know, like you can do it Rocky. Right. But I mean, like, to, to know that people are just in it with us regardless. And there's times where it's just like, listen, I'm just going to be with you. I'm just going to be with you. We don't got to talk. We don't. And sometimes, Hey, if you need to go be alone, just know that I'm still, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sending you a text. that says, I'm with you. I'm praying for you. You send an audio text. I love audio texting because then you can hear voice. You can hear the, the voice of, of the person that just wants to say, Hey, look, I just want you to know, I love you today. And that, that I'm just praying for you. And that's it. You know, maybe it's just as simple as that um, to just remind people that they're not alone. Because I think that that loneliness really leads to discouragement, and then discouragement robs us of what hope. I mean, that's that's exactly that the stuff that you're talking about. And um, we we're, we're kind of approaching the end of our convo here, Chris. But uh, but I I would love for you um, to just talk about you know, just the, where they can find. So, I mean, a little bit more about the website. Um, everybody, I, we don't have to probably search real far. We're probably all listeners, viewers, know someone who is 
who is journeying through cancer right now, um, or we're only one person removed. Um, and so, I mean, I'd love for you to just talk about, you said, I'd love to send you some links. Let's just make sure that we know every, where everybody can find these links. So talk about the website, what, what they can, you know, how they get plugged in, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're real easy to find. It's hopehasarrived.com. And even if you didn't get it right, it'll probably still come up or just search it in Google. But yeah, we, um, and once you land on there, it's it's very clear. There's like a, you know, say like find hope now in multiple places. You can kind of click on that button and it talks about the, the four different ways we help people find hope. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a great way to connect with us. You know, we are happy to, to pray for you and, you know, take prayer requests or, you know, you can get involved with our community. You can, um, you know, you can join our prayer and support group and we have you know, people who are going through cancer. We also have family members in there mm-hmm. or people who just have a heart for prayer, mm-hmm. you know? So like we, it's kind of a variety in there, but also within our community, you know, we send out, oh, we send out uh there's a new story of hope every month that we send out. We kind of have an email list and um, just always, sharing new content mm-hmm. you know just trying to like just put hope out there as much as possible yeah. so we're super easy to connect with you know we're on social media we're on yep. instagram and facebook um got a pretty good presence there um yeah and it's a free. great way to connect with us. it's free i mean it doesn't it's not a it's not like a membership thing they don't get to pay to, to it's a non-profit uh ministry so like i mean but to they can sign up for the newsletter. They can get all the all the resources for for free. Um, it, to, they can send links to other people, all that kind of thing. Yes, I think where we shine is um, we're a great resource to share with people. So you know, let's say you're listening, and you know you don't have cancer, but maybe you have some friends or other people. This is such a great thing to share with people because mm-hmm. it, it gets them right in the thick of this community. Like it's really difficult to fully understand what people go through. Um, and what's great is to help get them connected with a community that maybe can yeah. more so. Um, so we shine as a great resource, you know, that people can share with others. Um, also, we do have some in-person materials, you know, like uh, some of the cancer centers in the Midwest are using it. And we're okay. continually trying to expand that like into, as we got like uh, some other volunteers with Hope Arrive. They're doing, there's a big running event at Purdue coming up this weekend. And we're going to have a presence there. We're going to have a table. Okay. You know, all the people in their packets are going to be getting information. So we're, we're digital first, you know, that's the easiest way to find us, but we are growing with some in-person stuff too. And also this, this event in Sioux Falls is a really fun opportunity to come up. So. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's, uh, let's end our time here. So, um, on, on, um, Wednesday, April 24th, um, we're going to do a lunch here in Sioux Falls, put on, put on by crew. Um, that that's free of charge. So if people are in Sioux Falls, they're listening to this here uh, prior to April 24th, um, talk about how they can uh, plug into that lunch and uh, the lunch is free, but they they do need to register. So just talk a little bit more about just location, time, um, how to get registered. And then uh, we'll kind of end our time just giving you the opportunity to share a final word with everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this event, it's on April 24th. It's at the Country Club in Sioux Falls. It's uh, all you have to do to do it is you you, you email an RSVP to david.larson at cru.org. Yep. If you can't remember that, there's a link, hopeagainstcancer.org. Okay. And you can go there and sign up. And uh, it, it's just, what's really cool about this event, I got to say this, is that this was not my idea. This was not Hope Was Alive's idea. The people in the community of Sioux Falls, some concerned, you know, businessmen and, and, and Christians in Sioux Falls, I said, hey, what kind of topic should we feature? And of course, they're like, you know, we know a lot of people going through cancer and they put this together and they're paying for the launch. Mm-hmm. They're kind of paying for this whole thing. So, and opening it up to the public just so people can find some hope out there because there's a lot of people that do. and. You know, of course, after the 24th, Hope Was Rise not going anywhere. So you, yeah. you, you can find us, and we would love to love to be uh, 
helpful to you on your journeys. So. Yeah, that's so great. And and uh, yeah, so you can come if you, if you are able to April 24th, get yourself registered uh, in the outro. I'll talk again just about kind of that web or that email that you can email Dave, uh, Dave Larson to get registered. You can hear Chris share at that uh, at that event a little bit more in, in depth on his story. And, and uh, it's going to be a great time here in Sioux Falls. So if you're in the area, for sure, make a point to be in there. So, well, Chris, we always end our uh, each episode with something we call the final word, just, you know, anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds of whatever the Lord lays on your heart to just share with, with uh, the listeners and viewers. Um, could be encouragement, a challenge, a scripture. Um, so wh- what do you got for us as a final word? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I just think the longer I live, the more I see that, you know, hope, strength, and peace, they're just so important for us in life. Uh, we, we all need it, you know, whether we mm. have cancer or not, like that's, that is just so vital to keep us going. And I have been so encouraged to see that, you know, the, the greatest source of hope is, you know, Jesus Christ, the living hope. Mm. And it's just, what's great too, is you see that, that people want that. Like when, it, when the chips are really down, you know, like people want that. And uh, I, I love ministries like ResGen and others that are they're talking about this hope. So it's really fun to be on your show and get to talk about, you know, giving life and giving hope in a topic that is often not very hopeful. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's really good. Well, Chris, um, first of all, thank you for uh, just being a, a light for the kingdom. Um, just in your personal life and your marriage and your family. Um, I know that you really view as you're the primary minister in your home. And so thank you for just seeing um, just just your life as that. And, and you are utilizing a platform that you've been given that you didn't choose to, um, to share hope with the world and to um, really bring the world together. Um, when you talk about 3 million people in 151 countries, uh, a community that's being built, um, that is bringing the world together around the unifying hope of Christ. And so thank you for that. Thank you for your ministry, your heart, uh, the passion in which you serve. And um, I know that God's going to continue to use you and empower you for uh, for his ministry. And uh, thanks, thanks for sharing a bit of your story. Uh, here with me today and with the audience today and uh, excited to see how God continues to use your story to, to bless countless people around the world. Hey, thank you so much, Tom. I, I really appreciate you too. And your ministry is awesome. So thanks for having me. All right, brother. We'll talk soon. You got it. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Chris Lawrence today. As always, if you found this episode helpful, I encourage you to share it with others that may find it helpful as well. If you'd like to connect more with Chris, you can do so at hopehasarrived.com. Also, if you're listening to this during the first three weeks of April in 2024, don't forget to get registered for the free crew luncheon in Sioux Falls on April 24th from 1145 to 115, so you can hear Chris share more of his journey in person. To RSVP for that lunch, just send an email to david.larson at cru.org. All right, that's all for today. Thanks again for joining me, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the ResGen Giving Life Podcast. Until then, continue being men whose life in Christ gives life to others.